I, I, I can tell I'm <laughs> I can tell I'm a little glitchy on my video, so hopefully uh, my voice is coming through okay. I uh, guess somebody will chime in if, um, if you're not seeing um, what you're expecting to see. So I just wanted to welcome you all to uh, our Native Landscaping, a beautiful solution to pollution webinar. Uh, before we get started tonight, I wanted to just kind of walk through how the webinar is going to work. So as you can I probably already noticed uh, when you came in, your video was turned off and everybody is muted except for the panelists. Um, we're doing this just in the interest of time because we have quite a bit to cover today. And uh, so we're not gonna be accepting questions verbally. However, you can use the Q&A feature to submit questions if you have them. And as we're going through the presentation, uh, we'll try to answer those questions. And once we do answer those questions, if we are able to, uh, we will then go ahead and post the question and the answer so that everybody can see it. If we don't get to some of your que the questions that are posted, uh, we'll try to get to them at the end, or we will try to um, we'll address them in a follow-up email that'll come uh, later this week. So just make sure you use the Q&A feature and not the chat feature. We're not going to use the chat feature. We're going to use the Q&A feature. Okay. So we have a great group of presenters. You're very fortunate today uh, to have Emily Jorgensen. Uh, she's on the top upper left corner. And Emily is a conservation technician with the city of Madison. Then we have Maddie Dumas. She is a Greenway vegetation coordinator with the city of Madison. In the middle here is Teresa Nelson. And Teresa is a stormwater engineer for Dane County Land and Water Resources Department. Then up at the top right, we have Rick Eilertsen, and Rick Eilertsen is a stormwater engineer with AECOM. And I'm Crystal Campbell. I am a stormwater education coordinator with Dane County Land and Water Resources Department and the Madison Area Municipal Stormwater Partnership. We're really happy you're all here today. So the main reason we're here talking about native landscaping is because our landscape is changing and it has been for quite some time. So over the you know several hundreds of years, hundreds of years or thousands of years, our landscape has changed from what is predominantly, what was predominantly, you know, covered in forests and prairies uh, to something that looks like this picture on the bottom, especially in our, you know, very urbanized areas. So this picture on the right hand or on the left hand side um, on the bottom is a picture of present day Manhattan and uh, compared to what it may have looked like hundreds of years ago. So a more, a little bit Getting more, a little bit more local, uh, the picture on the right or the photographs on, on the right side of our screen are of the west side of Madison, near west side of Madison. Um, so just a change between, you know, from about 100 years ago. So the upper right picture or upper right photograph is an image of what Madison looked like back in 19, in the 1930s. Um, and then compared to what it looks like now in 2020. Uh, you can see kind of on, you know, on the left side of, of the image, a lot of rectangular uh, plots, agricultural plots, and then again, compare them to what Madison looks like right now, uh, where it's, you know, become very urbanized, uh, lots of neighborhoods, buildings, and roads. And when we change our landscape like this, not only does it, you know, it changes the landscape uh, quite a bit and, and how it's used, but the landscape, this change in the landscape and dramatic change in landscape can really change the way that water uh, flows over the land and the quality of our lakes, rivers, and streams. So in natural systems or, you know, pre-development, uh, much of the rain that fell uh, on our land soaked into the ground slowly, it recharges our, or it recharges our groundwater and our groundwater is our main source of drinking water, or actually our only source of drinking water here uh, in South Central Wisconsin and in much of Wisconsin. And as it flows through the soil, um, that water gets filtered, that, that rainwater, any pollutants that are in that rainwater gets filter, get filtered out and then they make their way to our lakes, rivers and streams very slowly. 
So as we start to develop our land, uh, not only, you know, urbanized land, but as we, you know, change the native landscape um, or natural landscape into, you know, into more of an agricultural landscape um, and obviously an urbanized landscape, as we start to develop that land, it really um, impacts the ability for the land to allow that water to soak in or infiltrate. So if you focus on that, um, you know, from the upper left hand corner, you can see, you know, pre development, uh, there was very, very little water running off. Most of that water infiltrated and kind of as you move um, through these pictures to the um, lower right hand side uh, or lower right hand image uh, where you have, you know, it's a, a pretty urban landscape with lots of buildings, uh, roadways, much of that water is not able to soak into the ground and most of it runs off. So when that water runs off uh, of all these surfaces, um, our rooftops and our driveways and our roads, uh, it runs off and it carries pollutants with it. Uh, and they enter the, our ditches and it enters our storm drains and our storm drains enter our storm sewer system, which um, washes water um, or transports water uh, directly to our lakes, rivers, and streams without, uh, without being cleaned or treated. So the problem is there's, there's just a lot of it. <laughs> so just to give you an idea of the amount of runoff we're talking about, um, an average home with you know, a, a rooftop of about uh, 1,800 square feet can produce more than 1,000 gallons of um, runoff during one one inch storm event. So that's the equivalent of about 15 large bathtubs full of water. And that's just, you know, that's just the runoff from, from one rooftop of one home. Now imagine, you know, multiple homes in, in one neighborhood and multiple neighborhoods, and then, you know, then include the driveways and the sidewalks and all the streets and these hard surfaces um, that that are, you know, the runoff is, is coming from, so are running off of. It you know equals a lot of water. It equates to a lot of water. So that runoff has to go somewhere, and too much runoff is the problem. That's what's that's what's causing our problems. Is just too much of this runoff. So our storm sewer systems, um, you know, start overflowing uh, and are just overwhelmed, and that's when that when it causes flooding in our streets. And we've seen quite a bit of that in the past. A few years here in the Dane County area. Water is also very powerful. It can cause, cause erosion. So as that water, um, you know, rushes um, through stream or through streams, it starts eroding away at our stream banks. It can also erode away soil from unprotected areas. So this is just an image of um, a construction site where, you know, that that soil or that sediment is not protected, it's not covered, it's easily dislodged with the rain and it carries it, you know, down our down our roadways into our storm drains. And even our agricultural fields, if you know it's not protected or they're not planted, um, but there's not plants on, on our agricultural fields to kind of protect that soil, that soil can run off as well. So all, when all that soil runs off, um, it ends up in our waterways and it can really pollute our waterways. So some of you might think, you know, soil sediment, it's natural. What's the problem with it? Well, the problem with soil and sediment is that it contains a lot of phosphorus and phosphorus, too much phosphorus can lead to um, algal blooms and the greening of our waters, as you can see down here. And that's an image that I feel like we've, we've seen quite a bit of uh, here in the Madison area and, you know, the past few years and, and years before. Um, not only does that water transport the sediment in the soil, but it also transports garbage and other pollutants and um, really can mess with our waters and, and muck up our waters. And, you know, obviously this harms wildlife. It also makes it just really, um, it, it reduces your desire to want to actually recreate in those waterways or boat or fish or swim. So it has a huge impact on, um, on our waters. So what we do on land really does impact our waters. And just to give you an idea uh, with regards to phosphorus, one pound of phosphorus um, can produce up to 500 pounds of algae. So I feel like I've kind of been a Debbie Downer so far. I'm talking about um, a lot about the problem um, and how we got here. It's time to talk about the solution. So the solution is to keep the rain where it lands. And we, we want to try to make our landscapes that look like this, that are covered with buildings and um, streets and parking lots, 
act a little bit more like this. And that's where native plants come in. And I'm gonna let Emily take over here. All right, so just like how Crystal talked about, um, stormwater runoff can have a lot of really negative effects, effects. But luckily, native plants happen to be extremely effective at intercepting and infiltrating these uh, stormwater runoff and mitigating these effects. Um, also, I'll put a plug in. Anytime you see a plant Dane symbol at the bottom of my screen, that means that the species listed right next to that will be available from the plant Dane program this year, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. But just keep an eye out for those. All right, so the first thing we'll do is I'm going to show you this video that um, depicts what is happening below the ground because that's where a lot of the magic is happening. Um, just going to share my screen here. This video was made by the Prairie Enthusiasts. And I think they did a really good job showing exactly what infiltration is. About 60% of the biomass is below ground compared to 40% above ground. All of this root matter underneath is how carbon is fixed in, into the ground. That's how you get the black soil. And what's happening is these plants are constantly sloughing off, developing new roots, old roots are dying. And over time, that carbon is getting left behind and keeps getting built up. So these roots die and get replaced they leave behind little channels when that uh, root system dies out that, that end up as being channels for water to percolate down through. And they've found the studies that they've done that um, original prairie sod can mostly eliminate the surface water, water runoff, whereas Kentucky bluegrass lawn is very shallow, shallow rooted and it's dense, that a lot of the rain ends up running off. And that happens in croplands as well. You, you just don't all right, and we'll switch back to um, Crystal, if you wouldn't mind sharing your screen again. Um, yeah, that video does a really good job just kind of showing what is happening below the ground. So those native um, plant roots are going to help increase infiltration, and they're also going to increase soil strength and stability, therefore reducing erosion. Thanks so much, Crystal. You're welcome. I may have to give you slide controls again yeah. as we move back into the presentation. Okay. Is that working for you? Should be. Great. Yeah, so there's just an image there that depicts exactly how deep these root systems go. Um, in this exhibit, they excavated the native plants so that people could actually see how extensive they were. And I love this image because um, I don't know if you can see from your screen, but a lot of those roots are actually tied up in a ponytail at the bottom um, because they were just too big for the exhibit. There's a lot of magic happening above ground as well. So those plant stalks and stems are able to intercept rainwater, which uh, allows for more infiltration. And it also prevents erosion from fast moving water because it slows things down, down a little and um, reduces some of that force of the water. They can also help intercept pollutants and prevent many of them from accumulating in dangerous levels downstream. So think about anything that might wash off of a road or a yard from a storm event, um, fertilizer, pesticides, sediment, motor oil, garbage, yard waste. Holding all of these pollutants on the local site rather than um, sending them downstream can help prevent a lot of damage. In addition to infiltration of water into the ground, uh, native plants are also able to um, return a lot of water back to the atmosphere through the process of transpiration. And just like the roots, the above ground plant matter is able to store quite a bit of carbon. Stormwater benefits aside, native plants are also pretty great in a lot of other ways. Um, they can be quite low maintenance after they're established, uh, especially if you kind of plan different levels of, of growth um, with ground covers and um, plants that work well together, they can really outcompete weeds and, and lead to a low maintenance planting in the future. The newly planted plugs may require a little bit of watering in the first year, but after they're established, they're usually just fine without any extra irrigation. 
There's no need for pesticides or fertilizers, especially compared to what is necessary to keep up with the typical American lawn. A lot of native plants actually thrive on nutrient poor soil. So fertilizer, fertilizers are, are normally something you don't even have to worry about with these plants. There's also hundreds of options. Native plants boast great diversity of species that have evolved to fit into niches from the sunny dry prairie to the shady wooded wetland and everything in between. And this diversity was supported by Native Americans who would often use fire or other management techniques to create a patchwork quilt type of landscape that promoted really high levels of biodiversity. And we're just gonna look at some inspiration here for what your different options may be. So you can choose a lot of plants depending on what time of year you want them to bloom. The spring ephemerals will be blooming as early as, as April. And um, when you go as late as October, you can find species that are in the goldenrod and aster family blooming as late as then. You'll have a lot of options for um, what kind of sun preference. Um, so if you have a shady yard, you'll have many options. Or if you have a sunny yard, you'll have many options. There's also a lot of options for height. So when many people think of a native planting, they visualize something that is very tall and unruly. But the truth is there are actually many options that never exceed two feet in height. For example, this sand coreopsis here. Um, on the flip side, if you are looking for that, that height and you want kind of like a screening type of planting, there are plenty of options for that too. So compass plant, the other sylphium family plants, sawtooth sunflowers, and in this picture, the big blue stem are all really good options for tall plants. There's also a lot of choice when it comes to um, your preferred growing habit. So if you are looking for species that grow and remain in a nice tidy clump, um, you may choose to um, plant some of the native short grasses like prairie drop seed in your space, or the sedge family is also um, quite often uh, a plant that grows in a tidy clump-like form. On the other hand, if you're looking for something that is able to grow as a clone and fill in space really nicely, there's a lot of options for that too. So just one example here is the wild strawberry is a nice native ground cover that is able to fill in space quite easily. My favorite part about native plants is that they are really, really great for wildlife, including pollinators. And by pollinators, I mean butterflies, bees, ants, moths, wasps, and hummingbird, hummingbirds. And you can choose what species you want in order to attract, you know, specific species of, of insects and other wildlife. Um, while it is true that non-native plants can sometimes provide some resources to insects, the specialist species are often left out in this scenario. Um, so planting those native plants are gonna provide resources for the specialist species. And when I say specialist species, the most famous example that comes to my mind is the monarch butterfly. So the monarch butterfly is reliant on plants in the milkweed family to survive. Without it, they won't be able to complete their life cycle. And so besides the monarch butterfly, there are are dozens of different species that are reliant on a specific native plant in order to survive. Uh, another myth about um, attracting pollinators is that you need to have an enormous space in order to attract them, and that's not true. Um, all of these photos taken above were actually taken in urban Madison, a lot of them on our stormwater land in, in very small plantings or small rain gardens. So if I've learned anything from working my current job, it's that if you plant this, the plants, the insects will come and the pollinators will come. And finally, native plants are very versatile. Um, if you're looking for a jungle-like planting, you can easily have that and let the plants fill in and thrive as they are. Or if you want something more tidy and deliberate, you can have that as well. And Maddie's gonna talk a bit more about that in her section up next. Um, but if you want to learn more about uh, how beneficial native plants are, I would highly recommend checking out the book Bringing Nature Home by Tug Douglas Tallamy. He um, 
is really inspirational if you're looking for some inspiration and he also has a lot of evidence to back up the benefits of native plants. And with that, I'll turn it over to Maddie. Thanks, Emily. All right. So I'd like to talk to you all a little bit about some design considerations as you're planning for your native landscaping. Um, and these design considerations can include things like the types of plants and their arrangement, um, site considerations like location of your planting and the shape, and then secondary functions like screening and wildlife habitat. So perhaps most important of all is location. Um, you can't easily change it once you've decided where you want your planting to go. So some things to consider would be how much sun your, your yard gets or your planting site gets. Um, and you may want to think about how your yard will change over time. You know, do you have a fast growing shrub in one area? Um, maybe your neighbor's thinking of putting up a privacy fence that might cast some shade. Um, think about the, the sun um, exposure you may be getting. And think about the view from inside your home. Um, is it going to drive you crazy if that native planting isn't centered perfectly in your picture window? Or do you want to have a sight line to a different view across the street? Um, think about other desired uses of your yard. Um, you know, maybe uh, you will not be used to walking around a planting to go to the mailbox to pick up the mail every morning. Um, and then think about the view from across the street, from the sidewalk. Um, what are, you know, strollers by going to see? Um, and along with that, um, being mindful of uh, others in your neighborhood. If you have a sidewalk, maybe don't put your rain garden, if you're planning one, right up next to the sidewalk where somebody could trip and fall in. Um, think about tall plants that may flop over into the sidewalk. Um, one thing I would recommend doing is taking a can of spray paint or a piece of string and laying out the shape and location of your planting and just living with it for a day or two uh, to see how you like it. Um, so we, we design things so that they function well and they look nice. And this may be particularly important with native plants because they have a reputation of, of looking kind of wild and growing kind of wild. Um, and if that's your aesthetic, that's great. Um, but maybe for some of you, it's been an impediment to using native plants in your landscaping until now, we hope. Um, so if you'd like to send sort of some cues of intentionality, hey, this, this is landscape, this is part of my yard, it's intentional. Um, things you could try are um, mulching your plants, particularly when they're young, um, adding some decorative edging, or if you're planting a rain garden, maybe a nice stone inlet uh, where that water is flowing in, strategically placed boulders or shrubs or container plantings, um, and then other man-made features or wildlife attractants like a, a bird bath or a bird feeder. Another consideration would be the shape of your garden. Um, you'll often see native plantings uh, in a bean shape, and there are a couple of good reasons for this. First, it's naturalistic. Um, second, it suits a slope really well. So if you have um, you know, a steeper slope in your yard, you can situate it so that the cup part is facing uphill. And whether you're planting a rain garden or not, um, as Emily described to you, those native plants are gonna take up some of that runoff from your lawn. So that's kind of an added bonus. Um, and then the view from downslope or on the sidewalk of a, of a curved curvilinear garden would be a little more fuller, a little more robust. So that's kind of a nice aesthetic um, feature. Um, you could also do a round planting, which can look really nice if you put your tall plants in the center and do tiered shorter plants all the way down to the edge. Um, a rectangular garden can have some of the same benefits of a bean-shaped planting and its ability to take up water if you orient that long side towards a downspot or something, uh, but it does have a more formal look if that's something you really like. Um, but then of course, don't be afraid to go crazy. You can do irregular shapes. Um, and I really like this example here because they not only did irregular shapes, but they did multiple plantings in a way that really complemented the shape of their yard and created some intrigue and mystery with that winding path, so. Get creative and, and think about how you want to fill up your space. A couple things to consider with topography. So first, you, you don't want to be fighting the topography of your yard. Most of us have at least a little bit of a slope. Um, and you can uh, use a, a curved shape planting to adapt to that. 
Um, in this planting on the left, you can see we did sort of a modified bean shape with a gooseneck, uh, which we extended up so that we could have native plants running next to this sidewalk here. Um, so there's a nice view for people as they're walking by. Um, and if you don't have a lot of topography in your yard, you can make some. You can use uh, topsoil to create a berm at the bottom edge of a planting or around your planting, um, or you can create little islands or gumdrops with um, soil. And that could be kind of a fun way to incorporate a variety of species with different moisture requirements or height requirements. So for example, you could put tall moisture levels plants at the lower part of your planting and then more dry adapted shorter species on a berm or an island or something like that. Um, if you are planning to do a rain garden you'll you'll have some excavation anyway so you'll have that soil to play with but you could also bring in soil if you want to play around. Um, another cue of intentionality is edging to kind of keep those plants uh, contained. And since we're talking about native plants, it's nice to pick natural materials. So stone or a natural looking paver is nice. Um, you can use logs or sticks. I particularly like the look of this planting on the right because they've used large stones to add an extra element to their planting. And they've allowed plants to grow in between the cracks. And you could certainly replicate this look in Wisconsin by using some of our dry adapted species like uh, columbine or some sedges prairie smoke, things like that would do really well. All right, so your planting design is getting more into consideration about your species that you want to use. Um, and this will have to do with uh, where you want to put your plants inside your actual planting. And I won't talk too much about this because we have a ton of great resources to share with you after this class. Um, Xerxes Society, our, our own City of Madison engineering website, um, Audubon Society, a lot of great organizations have put time and thought into um, where plants should go based on when they bloom, how the colors complement each other, um, height arrangement, moisture tolerance, you name it. Um, and then a good planting plan will also usually be organized by um, sun requirements. So if you know you've got a shady yard, you can pick a shady planting plan. You've got a partially shady area and so on and so forth. Just one more consideration regarding location of your planting. Um, you may wanna check with your municipality if they have any guidelines about where you can plant, particularly in um, the terrace area here, which is the area between the sidewalk and the street. Um, this is the city of Madison guidelines for terrace plantings, but you can see it also extends to the corners of private property, this zone A here, this yellow triangle. Um, the idea behind this is just to promote safety. So there's no, vision hazard if you're backing out of your driveway and your neighbor's walking their dog down and you've got you know, sweet corn growing in the corner, you don't wanna run over anybody. So there are high restrictions. Zones A and B in this diagram are 30 inches high. Zone C is a little bit shorter, only eight inches. Again, this is just for city of Madison, but the idea there is if a vehicle is parked on the street, um, a passenger's not stepping out into a jungle. Um, one more consideration with um, your site location, this is good to consider as we're looking at this driveway and sidewalk, is snow storage in the winter. So um, one nice thing about native plants is they, they tend to be really hardy and we have native plants in our medians um, that just get dumped on with snow that's plowed there. Um, we have plants along our bike paths, same story, and they really do well. Um, so that's, that's kind of a nice thing, although again, it'll probably be holding snow a little bit longer in the spring. Um, but you will want to be a little bit careful if you use salt on your sidewalk or driveway because some of our native plants are tolerant of salt and, and some are not. So uh, you can find that information in, in good planting plans as well. All right, and height, of course, is not just a vision obstruction, but an opportunity. Um, one nice thing about our, some of our prairie plants is that because they get so tall, if you just want some growing season screening, maybe you've got like a patio that you just you like to have a little bit of privacy when you're entertaining in the summer. Um, this is a great way to do it. Uh, some of our native prairie plants can get 10 or even 12 feet tall and they do that in one growing season. Um, another cool thing about that is you can change and play with the sight lines from your window. Maybe you want to block off that, you know, whatever ugly sight out of the one window, but you want to be able to see out the other. So you can really play around with height. And then of course, at the other end of the spectrum, 
We have lots of shorter species, as Emily talked about, and these are going to have a wide range of um, moisture tolerance as well as shade tolerance. Light, again, your planting plan should look at this, but just something to always be aware of as you're uh, trying to site your, your planting. Um, bloom time is something to consider. Your planting plan is going to look at this, but um, double check your planting plan and make sure that you've got some plants that are supposed to bloom early and some plants that are supposed to bloom later in the season. And I'd just like to put a shout out for early blooming plants in particular. Um, uh, we know with climate change that we've had more unpredictable weather in the spring, and this has caused a lot of stress on our native pollinators in particular, as well as our birds. Um, and other wildlife uh, as they search for food in that early part of the season. Um, maybe there were cues early on that indicated they should come out of hibernation or start that next stage of the life cycle, but then we go back to cold or wet weather um, that really stresses them out. So having early blooming plants is really helpful to pollinators and it's also just beautiful. So a couple of good options listed here. And then of course, late bloomers are just, they look nice, they power through those, last generation of migrating monarchs um, and add a lot of fun color to your yard. Other considerations, soil type and moisture. Um, again, you're gonna see some of this on your planting plans, um, but we'll, what will not be included in your planting plan is uh, what your particular yard is like. So make sure you pay attention if you've got like a soggy corner of the yard, that's a great place to put some wet loving plants. And if you've got that really hard baked dry spot next to the house where you wanna put some native plants, um, think about what can handle that kind of intense heat and, and dryness. So something to consider with native plants is the growth pattern. And because um, we have so many different native plants, some of them adapted to fill in disturbed areas early and grow aggressively and quickly great for new native plantings because you get color right away. Um, these four species here, um, they tend to spread clonally through the root system and they grow really, really fast. Um, what you may want to do later on in your planting, if you've got, you know, a lot of brown-eyed Susan growing is just dig some out and share some with a friend. Um, you don't have to be afraid to use these aggressive plants, but just uh, be aware that they may spread rather quickly. On the other end of the spectrum, there are plants like Shooting Star, which may take quite a bit longer to get growing, uh, which isn't to say they can't form large clones, just that they are a little bit more conservative. Um, Shooting Star can take up to seven years to bloom, um, but once they bloom, they're really gorgeous. And then think about the shape of the flowers. So Prairie Blazing Star has a narrow, tall spike of color, which can really add some interest to your garden. Uh, likewise, cardinal flower has a, a narrow spike of flower, and it's that bright red color that so few of our native plants are um, that attracts hummingbirds, which is great. However, cardinal flower is a short-lived flower, um, so if you want it to continue to be in your garden, you may have to bring in more plants or uh, let those seeds ripen and fall where they are so they can grow more next time. Again, touching on pollinator favorites, uh, whatever planting plan you go with, uh, if it doesn't have a milkweed plant, please consider including them. Uh, we know that it takes 30 stems to produce one adult monarch butterfly. That's research done by uh, Karen Hausbeck at the uh, UW Arboretum. Um, and it's just important to note, it's something easy to do. Honestly, we have such beautiful, sweet smelling uh, milkweed plants. It's just a great option. These are some other native uh, pollinator favorites. Meadow Blazing Star up in the upper right-hand corner is considered to be a monarch's favorite food by some. It's just hard to see a Meadow Blazing Star in flower that doesn't have at least a couple butterflies on it. And one more consideration for wildlife. Um, as part of your garden, you might wanna incorporate uh, other cues of intentionality. As we discussed, you know, a bird bath or a bird feeder um, that bird bath is water, uh, not just for birds, but for pollinators as well. Um, they even have nifty uh, pollinator bee houses you can buy or make, something like this on the right or the left, sorry. Um, and then other things you can do to be considerate to our pollinators um, are to 
use grasses, wildflowers, and shrubs so that um, insects that require uh, those different types of plants to complete their life cycle have everything they need right there in your planting or in your yard. Um, and then if you can, leave vegetative litter and, and dead wood lying around your yard um, because those are needed for uh, pollinators to complete their life cycle. You will probably be surprised once you start putting these native plants in your yard uh, who might show up. Uh, you can see even in our most urban areas, sometimes we get uh, really fun wildlife visitors. And with that, I think we're gonna take a little break, right, Crystal? We are. Okay, thanks, Maddie. Um, up next, when we return, we'll introduce a few native plant projects that you can do um, in your own yard or in your own or in a nearby green space. Uh, but before we leave for a five minute break, I'm going to pull up a poll. We just want to get a sense for, you know, how much experience you have with native gardening. Uh, are you new to native gardening or are you a native garden expert? I'm going to launch this now. And I'm going to leave it up throughout the break. So to stay on track, uh, it's 638 on my on my uh, clock. We are going to return, let's say, uh, 735. So we'll start up again at 735. And if you could just answer the poll question uh, before you head out for your break, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Attention to your watch <laughs> and not, uh, not the time I gave you. So five minutes from <laughs> from before. So we're going to start up again at 645. And uh, thanks for taking the poll. It gives us just a little bit of an idea as to, you know, how familiar are or how much experience you have with native gardening. And it looks like we have uh, quite a few people that are that are new to native gardening. And that's, that's great. Hopefully we can inspire you to, uh, to start a little project in your yard. <laughs> and with that, I am going to hand it over to Teresa. All right, thanks, Crystal. There we go. So the first thing that we're going to be talking about tonight is um, just native gardening. So very similar to regular gardening, except focusing on using native plants that provide the habitat and other benefits that um, Crystal and, and Maddie and Emily have already talked about tonight. So um, just as a, uh, uh, some info to give to you, I tried to add some of the common names to some of the, the, the images in these pictures and um, just so that you can kind of see what they are and we will be providing uh, a resource that also has the the latin names with those so if you need to help looking those up you'll be able to find that so tonight i'm going to talk about you know where you can put uh, native plants in your yards and how you can go about doing that so to start out with the where Really, you can put native plants just about anywhere in your yard, just like you would plant anything else. And um, one of the easiest places to add native plants is to put them in uh, garden beds that already exist. Uh, you don't have to do much prep. Maybe there's nothing growing there now. Maybe something that you had planted there already had died. Um, and these can be more formal or more informal plantings. Um, and you can plant you know, native plants along with non-native plants. There, there really are no rules in this. Here's another example of uh, a garden bed in the, the front yard of a friend's property. Um, there was one small tree and one other little perennial in there and a couple of rocks. And we thought this was a really great place to add some um, native plants. So we added some, some short growing native plants, some that'll attract monarchs, some that'll attract hummingbirds. You can see with their hummingbird feeder, they were interested in attracting those. And, um, you know, Again, it was really easy. The, the bed was already there. We only had to dig holes and, and stick some plants in. 
Here's another example of, you know, kind of a small spot between your sidewalk and your garage. Maybe you have a sidewalk that, that wraps around. This really was a place where there was some gravel and one spirea plant. And by adding some native plants in here, we gave it, you know, a lot more interest, a lot more something interesting to look at, um, as well as providing, you know, that little pocket of pollinator habitat throughout the year. Here's an example of, um, it's right outside a business in Lodi. And again, you can see how they mixed both native and non-native plants in this planting. You know, you have some hostas and daylilies, but then you also have some milkweed and some Joe pie weed. Um, so I thought this was really nice, uh, a nice example of how you can mix those together. Another option if you want to incorporate native plants into your yard is through the use of a pollinator lawn. So um, with a pollinator lawn, basically you allow low growing perennial plants that benefit pollinators to grow in your lawn and you treat it like a regular lawn. You can mow it, um, except that you won't be spraying it with, with herbicides and pesticides. Um, you know, one interesting thing to note is that white clover, um, which isn't a native, but it is beneficial to pollinators, used to be part of those, you know, lawn seed seed mixes a long time ago because clovers help um, take nitrogen from the atmosphere and bringing it into the soil, which helps, you know, the lawn grow and adds nitrogen um, uh, for the availability for those plants as well. So some of the um, other options you would have for a pollinator lawn, some of the native options include common violet and also um, a little plant called self heal. And like I said, these can handle some mowing. Um, and do provide that, that early pollen source. And you can even um, participate in something called no mow may. So um, you know, if you do have those flowers in your lawn, um, the goal of no mow may is to allow grass to grow unmown for the month of May. So it creates habitat and forage for the early season pollinators, um, particularly important in urban areas where you know, those resources are often pretty limited, especially early on in the season. Um, and some communities even officially suspend their weed ordinances during that time so that you don't have to worry about getting in trouble for letting your lawn grow, um, grow you know, high. And it doesn't have to be your whole lawn. Last year we did this, we left just the center of our backyard uh, unmowed for the, the month of May and you know, watched all of the things that, that got to visit those spaces. So another opportunity for adding native plants to your yard are shady spots. You know, often these are places where grass doesn't grow very well already, or maybe some other plants have failed that you put there. Um, and is really an opportunity to put the right plant in the right place. So something that likes it shady, maybe it's dry shade. So you'd pick a plant that was specific, um, specific for that particular location. And it provides gives you the opportunity per, to provide soft landings. So this is something um, uh, that you, you um, don't mow and you don't put landscape fabric under your trees, you plant native plants. Um, a lot of insects need um, that, that place underneath the tree to finish their life cycle. You know, they'll, they'll munch on the leaves and then they'll drop down and they need to burrow into the soil or burrow into the leaf litter. Um, so this is a great opportunity to give them that space. And it can be something obviously very, very beautiful to look at. And again, you're putting the right plants in the right place. Maybe it's a shady spot uh, under those trees. And so you would add plants that really um, do well in the shade. Another opportunity is soggy spots. Um, oftentimes we have those places in our yards that you know water kind of collects or when it when it rains water flows through there and they don't again tend to be places where the grass grows very well or maybe it's hard to mow um, this gives you the opportunity to put you know plants in there that would like that that you know wetter area and then you don't have to worry about mowing you don't have to worry about you know that soggy spot and the grass growing um, so this is a, a great opportunity Another spot is steep slopes. So areas where it might be difficult or dangerous to mow, you know, take out the lawn, take out the grass and put in some native plants. And of course, you can always add things, you know, create new gardens, um, you know, a, a nice uh, add interest around your mailbox is in this example. 
And you can also kind of make use of existing edges. So, you know, this bed I added next to my um, the side of my garage and sidewalk. It was kind of a hard place to mow anyway. So I just put in one little piece of edging and kind of um, created that new garden bed. And I knew that it was, you know, really hot and dry there. The grass didn't even really like to grow. So this was a perfect spot to add some native plants that really like it hot and dry. Here's another example of a spot. Um, at this uh, location, they had a big ash tree that had died and had to be removed. And they, there was quite a bit of disturbance that occurred um, when they did that. So it was a perfect place to add a new garden bed. And we you know, added, again, plants that um, would attract pollinators and um, provide flowering um, plants throughout the season. I'm not entirely sure how well this border is going to work. It might be a little hard to maintain, but it, it sure looked cool when they when they put it in. And finally, if you don't have any space at all, you can always um, plant native plants in containers. So you, you would likely want to pick shorter plants and plants that like it a little bit drier because containers do tend to dry out pretty quickly. Um, and you still will have to water a little bit. Um, I've kind of ignored these plants last summer and they still did pretty well. And here's another example. Um, uh, the Green Bay chapter of Wild Ones has done kind of a lot of experimenting with native plants and containers and they have some um, resources and the links we'll be sending out afterwards that kind of list some of those species that do well in containers. So now we get into the how. How do you, um, how do you incorporate these? How do you plant these in your yard? So the first thing is you want to get rid of those invasive species. Um, anything that would be a problem now, you don't want to plant into. Uh, you want to get rid of them so you can do some research on the best way to eradicate those. And then oftentimes you're going to have to think about you know, maybe removing some lawns. So you can do it manually with a flat shovel, or you can um, rent a sod, a sod cutter. Um, you can also till, um, but this does tend to bring uh, weed seeds up to the surface, so you may have to kind of battle that if you want to go that direction. Um, you can smother with cardboard. Um, this works really well. Put some cardboard down, put some mulch over it, leave it for a few weeks and the grass is mostly dead and then you can plant right into that. Another way to kill the grass is through solarizing with clear plastic. Again, this is something that you leave on for two to three weeks and it pretty much kills the, the grass underneath. And finally, you, know, you can use herbicide, obviously, according to you know, manufacturer's directions, use, use it correctly, use it sparingly, but it is a quick way to kill the grass and then you can actually plant right into that dead sod. And then you don't have to worry about kind of bringing up additional weed seeds to the surface and, and doing a lot of disturbance. So Maddie did talk a little bit about edging, but sometimes we, we want to do that. You know, it, it gives kind of a definition to our bed. It helps keep the you know grass if there's grass growing nearby, helps keep that out of your your bed. And there's obviously a lot of different kinds you can use, um, from you know black plastic to other um, uh, bricks or pavers. Uh, there's even you know kind of black metal pieces that you can use. And you know, as Maddie mentioned, you can even use more natural materials like logs, which provide habitat themselves. But you know, it is really important to kind of get that, that edge and cut that edge next to the grass. It does help keep the, the grass from growing into your planting. And we, um, we will have a video to share in our resources that explains the best way to do that. Then you know mulching helps to keep you know the weed competition um, away from your plants while they're getting established. There's a lot of different kinds of mulch you can use: hardwood mulch, um, maybe grass clippings, other things like that. You can do it before or after you plant. I tend to like to do it after I plant, especially if I'm planting small plants. Um, it's just easier to to plant right into that mulch. I often use cardboard and then use the mulch. It kind of gives you that extra little uh, weed barrier along the way. And you know the idea is that you know if you plant your plants close enough and they sort of create this plant community that you don't have to continue mulching. It really makes less work for you and is better for the habitat. So you can see in this 
garden um, early on in the upper left was right after it was planted. You can see all the mulch. I don't even know if I added mulch the second year, but now you can see in the lower right that it's you know completely filled in with plants and I don't worry about mulch at all. And then as far as planting, you know, you're planting native plants like you would other things. Um, if you're planting a lot of plants, uh, a bulb auger works really well for making a lot of small holes. Um, and, you know, it's always great to have help as you're planting. And, you know, it's, you also wanna make sure that you water really well after you plant those plants, like you would any other plant. It helps move that soil around the roots and gets rid of any air pockets. And then I suggest, you know, giving giving some um, signs to your neighbors to show, you know, what you're doing and why you're doing it. There are a number of different organizations that uh, will provide a sign, usually for a small fee, that you can put in your yard and just kind of indicates, you know, what you're doing. If you're creating habitat, if you're creating monarch habitat, etc. And you know, like Maddie said, you never know who's going to um, show up. Um, not only will you enjoy your native plantings, but many different visitors will come um, and enjoy those too. Thanks, Teresa. So now that you've learned about the basics um, and how easy it can be to incorporate natives into your landscape, we're gonna focus on a couple of tweaks to your average na native garden uh, that can really pack a punch when we're trying to reduce runoff from your property. So one way that you can do this, uh, we're just kind of taking it, uh, building off what Teresa uh, talked about with a native garden and just adding a little more. So uh, this is called a downspout garden and a downspout garden uh, is pretty, <laughs> pretty easy to understand. It's a small native garden uh, that you amend the soil, where you amend the soil with compost and it's located near the discharge of your downspout. And then you just plant that garden with native plants. So downspout gardens are a great option uh, to capture roof runoff. Um, often, uh, you know, their downspouts are directed towards uh, lawns or sometimes they're directed to, uh, hopefully not, but sometimes they're directed to our driveways or sidewalks uh, just to kind of get rid of that water. Well, remember what I talked about, one of our solutions is we want to keep rain where it lands. So we really want to uh, intercept that uh, that runoff or that roof runoff and help it to infiltrate and downspout gardens can really help do that. So, you know, you might even have your downspout directed right now to um, maybe your lawn and uh, which which is, which is great. Uh, it's much better than having it directed to an impervious surface or your driveway. Uh, but over the course of many years, especially uh, it, urban lawns uh, become somewhat compacted. And depending on how much use and traffic uh, is, is on that lawn, those lawns can become pretty hard. And it actually, a lot of lawns, urban lawns do not um, infiltrate water very well. So that's why we're encouraging a downspout garden in those areas. And it's kind of a great location because you already have a mechanism to get that um, get that water where you want it. So in redirecting your downspout isn't that big of a deal. So you want to just locate that garden or locate the garden at the discharge of your downspout um, and and really intercept that that roof runoff and that really can help um, prevent that water from washing down our hard surfaces, picking up pollutants and ending up in our storm drains and into our waterways. So we're not talking about a huge garden here. You can make it big if you want, but um, even a small garden uh, really can make a, a big difference. So even a small five by five, 25 square foot garden uh, can really have an impact. So the first thing you want to do is think about location. Um, so most of our homes have downspouts and downspouts are located uh, near the corners of our of our homes. So this is an aerial photograph of my home here in Madison. Uh, the red dots are the downspouts are uh, where my downspouts come down. And you know, you, you want to locate your downspouts, but also think about uh, the area around your downspouts and how you use that area. So for me, um, this I have a rain garden already up in the upper upper right hand corner of my of my um, of my home. The 
this area towards the, um, the left up or left front of my home it doesn't get a lot of sun so that's it kind of limits me with the amount the types of plants I could I could use there uh, and this area towards the the rear uh, the back right corner there's a vegetable garden right there and that's right where we actually have a fence to our backyard and a, and a gate so there's a lot of traffic that that flows through that gate um, into you know that's our main way from to get from the front yard to the backyard. So that's not an ideal location for a downspout garden because we'd just be walking right through it all the time. So for me, the ideal location was actually this, um, the lower left-hand corner um, towards the backyard. Um, this downspout actually was a, was a great location for a downspout garden. Uh, it's an area of, of our property that is really hard to get to with a lawnmower because we have a swing set that's, that's pretty close by and there's just not much there. So. Um, it actually helps the fact that I, I don't have to get a, a lawnmower back there to try to you know maintain the grass there. Um, it gets a lot of sun. I can't get far enough from that uh, from that corner of the house to really put in a rain garden. So a downspot garden was actually a, a great option there. So once you figure out your location, you want to try to figure out how to direct that roof runoff or that downspout to the garden, wherever that's going to be. And it's those are pretty. It's pretty easy to do. Uh, you know, hopefully, again, hopefully your downspout isn't pointed towards uh, towards your driveway or impervious surface. If it is, I suggest changing it at least um, to run off into the grass. Uh, but you know, just. Um, using a, a different elbow to redirect your downspout to where you need it is pretty easy, um, or a flexible tubing like the one up here in the upper right corner, or you know you can even get really creative and and kind of make a feature out of it. Uh, that lower lower corner, the picture in the lower corner is um, you know just using some some stones and directing the water to where you want want it to go uh, using stones. So that's kind of a fun feature too. And then really, uh, again, building off what Teresa and everybody else has talked about, um, then comes the fun part, you know, you want to design your downspout garden, think about uh, a planting plan, and the different features you might want in your downspout garden, do you want edging, uh, do you want some stones, what types of plants do you want in your downspout garden, uh, the one thing I would uh, suggest is this just where, where that water comes out of the downspout, uh, just make sure you pick plants that can withstand both dry and wet conditions because it'll experience both. You won't get ponding water there like you would in a rain garden, but um, but just make sure that you you know get the plants that can can tolerate wet and dry conditions there. So now it's time to prep your site. Um, you got to get rid of that vegetation somehow, either smother it or remove it. Uh, Teresa gave you some great options for that. And what makes a downspot garden a little different than a regular garden is you're going to, or a native garden, uh, just a regular native garden, is that you are going to dig to a depth of about six inches. So it's going to be pretty important to call diggers hotline and get an idea where your utility lines are so you're not, you're not digging into there. Um, you know, you could also, uh, before you decide to smother that area. If you don't know where those utilities are, you could also contact Diggers Hotline uh, you know, before you, you actually kill the vegetation there uh, to make sure that's the spot you want. You want to actually build your, build your downspot garden. Um, but then you may want to call again um, and get it, get it remarked uh, just to make sure you, you know exactly where those, those utilities are. So once you call Diggers Hotline, you have it all marked out. Um, you're going to you know, avoid all these areas. Uh, you want to start digging and loosening up that soil to a depth of about six inches. After that, you want to remove about half of that soil. So use it somewhere else on your property, but actually take it out of that location. And then replace that soil that you removed uh, with some compost. And you're going to mix that compost in. Uh, that compost is you know, rich in organic matter. It's going to really help um, absorb some of that water. After that, uh, just spread that soil compost mixture, um, just spread it out. Uh, make sure, however, to uh, that the garden slopes away from the foundation and you know, so it doesn't drain back to, to the home. That's really important. And then again, comes the fun part. So then you go ahead and you plant your natives, uh, cover it with mulch. Uh, to make sure you kind of protect that soil. And then uh, this is optional, but redirect that downspout if you have um, until the plants take hold. So if you have really small plants, um, you might want to redirect that that downspout so it's not, you know, 
water isn't gushing over those small plants when they're when they're kind of fragile. Uh, but if you have larger plants, it might not be that big of a deal. And then uh, go ahead and reposition your downspout. I forgot to mention this, I think, in the previous slide, but it's really, really important that when you are designing your downspout garden, that that um, that downspout discharges at least five feet from uh, from the foundation of your home. Again, you don't want that water um, you know, flowing back towards your home and causing problems that way. So make sure that downspout discharges at least five feet uh, from, from the foundation of your home. And then once it's planted, uh, go ahead and water it until those plants get established and watch it grow. Uh, I say watch it grow, but, uh, and mine, this is my downspout garden that I planted last year, early summer, and it was doing great watering it. The plants were growing for the first month. We went on vacation and I came back and, um, all the plants were were eaten down to to the ground and so learn from my mistakes and consider if you have uh, furry friends that like to visit your yard consider fencing it for the first year uh, this is obviously another garden but you get you get the idea um, so consider fencing it for the first year just to prevent those uh, those furry friends from eating your garden. Uh, and then, you know, once after the first year, once it's established, uh, it's, they're not as appealing, the plants aren't as appealing to the, to the critters as they were that when they're, you know, fresh, plant, fresh new plants like that. I'm gonna hand it over to Rick to talk about rain gardens. Yeah, and just uh, before, actually, I'm gonna just go back to, the, to, that, to that previous sure. slide if I can. Um, so the, 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 there's actually the rain, the picture in the bottom right is actually uh, uh, Roger Bannerman's rain garden, his, mm -hmm. his back rain garden. You can see in the background that I have for, for my video, that's actually Roger Bannerman in, in, in his front yard in 2009 when, when he let us uh, um, dig up a lot of the plants and then put those in the Fitchburg Community Garden. So just a, a little quick tidbit, Roger has been considered, uh, he's passed away just recently, unfortunately. But he's been considered uh, Madison's uh, kind of pioneer for rain garden um, design and uh, um, and and maintenance. Um, so we we did, last year we did a three part series on on you know that highlighted a lot of information on rain gardens. So I'm not going to obviously cover that that full three part series that is available online if you go to uh, the resources that Crystal will will point point out. Um, this is my son Evan in the in the photo. Um, getting ready to, to, to dig out our rain garden. Um, so basically what our rain gardens, um, they're basically just, you're, you're just digging a depression, generally in a, a three inch, you know, to eight inch depth, um, where you're actually temporarily pooling water, um, storing water so that it can drain, hopefully drain down into the soil and then not leave as runoff. So that's really the, the, the key. Um, in the image um, in this in this uh, slide, um, you generally have you know the center of the rain gardens generally the deepest part and usually um, you know what will be the the wettest most most often. Um, kind of depends on what the soils are like, um, but uh, you know just you, with those different moisture levels, there are certain plants that'll that'll survive better in certain areas, and so you you, you kind of pick those plants based on. The zone within the rain garden as well as the soils underneath. I'll just do a, a little um, kind of graphical depiction of what happens during um, a storm and if I can get this to work. So water you know, starts raining, water starts coming towards the rain garden, um, storms uh, starts to fill in. Some of that water does start to infiltrate into the soil and um, and then we'll fill up in the in the rain garden. This this picture actually shows an underdrain. Now most residential rain gardens don't have underdrains, but that is certainly something that you can put in, especially if you've got uh, tight soils or you know if you do, the soils underneath the 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 portion that you dig are clay, then then you may want to consider putting an underdrain just so that it drains down more. You know within a you know generally the the the, the goal is to to drain that water down within a 72 hour period helps to, to, to make most, most vegetation can survive being inundated for, for that long or, or less. Um, once you get, you know, um, being saturated conditions for longer than that or standing water for longer than that, um, there's a lot fewer, there's a, a much lower selection of plants that'll survive that. 
Um, and then the other thing is, is you know, the, the longer you have water standing there, unless you've got uh, um, predators for mosquito larva, um, you have the chance that the mosquito can, can survive. And so generally that three day, 72 hour um, max, you know, time for drawdown is, is kind of the magic number that we've, that we've generally go, gone by. Um, so first thing, you know, we've talked a little bit, quite a bit actually about uh, Digger's hotline and uh, Jennifer actually had a good question. I have a gas line and water line running through my front yard where I'd like to plant a flower garden. Do you recommend avoiding this area or is it, or is it okay to, to plant over top of? Maddie had a, a good response there, definitely calling Digger's hotline. If you're not changing the grade, you're probably not, you know, it's, it's probably fine. But if you are lowering the grade, like a digging a rain garden, that could certainly be a problem for the water main uh, or the water service um, in potentially freezing it if, you, if you're basically um, lowering the, the surface of the ground. And you, you could also, if, if there's a gap, you know, if there's other utilities there, you could, you know, lower the, the depth of the, the surface. But if you're basically planting at the current grade, you're probably fine. The, the big issue is, you know, if, you know, at, at some point they're made, they may need to, to replace that that water service or that gas that gas service and and you have to think about you know is it all right if I if that plant gets dug up, dug up or or not um, but uh, um, here's a I guess in the upper right hand corner um, there's just a soil excavation so digging a digging a hole so you really want to understand what the soils are like um, Evan is uh, holding a soil probe so you can actually check those soil probes out for most UW extension um, county offices. Um, and then, you know, it's a nice way to, to quickly get at least a, a, a you know, 12 inch depth, um, if you can push it down that far. Um, otherwise, you know, digging with a, with a shovel after you called Digger's Hotline is, is definitely good. Um, one of the keys for understanding what, how, how rapidly that water will drain down is to do a ribbon pass. So you basically take that soil, rub it, in your in your hand and try to see if you can roll it out. If it doesn't, if it just breaks up right away, generally it's likely pretty sand. You can oftentimes see the actual sand particles in the soil, and it and it doesn't. You can't roll, you know, to to get more than more than probably a uh, an inch is at most with if it's just sand, even if it's pretty wet. Um, and then you know the longer that that uh, that soil rolls out into a roll. The clayer that is, and and that has a big fact, a, a big, uh, um, it, it makes a big difference in the amount of 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 you know, how the basically the impermeability, the permeability of that soil. Um, sandy soil generally can can uh, take on about three to six inches per hour or more sometimes. Um, and clay soils, you know, are almost you know almost doesn't let, uh, but especially if it's compacted clay, it really is gets to be pretty impervious. It doesn't allow water to to drain down through. The bottom right hand corner shows um, some students uh, at the Leopold Elementary School actually doing what I call a poor man's uh, infiltration test. So basically take a coffee can, fill it with two inches of water and then you time how long it takes to, to get down. So that's, you know, for, for that to drain down all together. So that is, it gives you a really good indication of, of uh, how, how well, you know, what you, what you might have if you, we basically put a rain guard in a situation like that. This is just a, 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 a plan view. So looking down from above your home, um, you know, to, to, to the, where your home is, and then um, looks at, uh, you know, potential locations that, that uh, a rain garden might work on your site. It's showing basically a zone around the perimeter of the home. We generally recommend that you, that you start a rain garden at least 10 feet away. Um, again, that's different than the five foot dimension primarily because we're, we're, we're really focusing or you know, hopefully hoping to recharge a lot more water than what a downspout garden would. And so, um, you know, especially if you've got a basement, you know, that's something that to be, to be very cautious of. You don't wanna, we don't wanna infiltrate water, you know, and then, and then create your own basement drainage problem. Um, so that's generally why we, we, why we recommend that 10 foot uh, minimum distance away before you start uh, uh, a rain garden. It can be more too if if uh, if you'd like. 
Um, and then the bottom um, shows basically a profile view of that, again, generally that 10 to 30 foot uh, distance and kind of depends on how large your, your, your lot is. You know, generally want to want to build if, if, if it's your rain garden you want to build it on your property unless you've got permission from wherever else your your uh, your the property owner that you're building it on um, and again um, we already talked a little about just prepping the the soil so hand rent sod cutters um, like are in the upper left hand corner um, which is a nice way to, to actually get rid of that sod without having to use herbicide um, you can just generally a lot of people will just put it out at the curb saying free, free sod and, and, and generally people are, are will come and, and pick it up um, at, at no additional cost to you. And this is basically just prepping out. So, you know, using a line level. So a string with a, what's called a line level um, to basically identify a level, uh, level ground. Um, and you wanna basically dig your depression. You can oftentimes use the soil that you dig out of the rain garden as part of the berm around the perimeter of the rain garden to hold the water in like what's shown in the bottom right hand corner. Again, there's a lot of good resources, both the, the, the video series that we did last year, as well as the resources that Crystal will be, be uh, um, sending out to folks. And then here's some different, uh, um, it, you know, obviously the plant dane is a great way to get plants. Um, you can also, a lot of times people have, are, are are modifying rain gardens that they have. You know, there's a lot of native vegetation that's that's around. Um, you may be able to, to talk with them and get permission to either gather seed from those those other rain gardens, or um, you know, once if, if they're pretty well established, there may be opportunities to actually you know dig portions of the plants out. Again, you want to think about about what uh, invasives might be in those areas that you might be transferring to to you know your rain garden. Um, and, and, you know, give, give an idea, you know, at least it's, think about it anyway. And, and you know, if, if it's something you're concerned about, then you, that might change what, how you decide to do it. Another option um, to consider is uh, terrace rain garden. So generally that's, that's in the, the municipal, municipality's right of way. So that's, you know, generally have to talk with them, identify if they've got a, a plan for that. A lot of times, you know, you might actually be responsible for maintaining that anyway, and so um, it's a good thing to to chat with your your local municipality and see if that's something that that uh, they allow. Um, and sometimes they, there's actually even a credit program for if that if there is a rain garden on in the right of way, there may be an opportunity to get a small reduction on your stormwater utility bill uh, or property tax. Um, but anyway, it's a nice way to beautify use that landscape or use that land for for stormwater benefit. Um, but again, that's that's you know if it's not your property, then you need to definitely make sure that you have the appropriate agreements to be able to do that. I think that's all that I've got. Thanks, Rick. At this time we're gonna just pull up one more poll question. And the question is just, what type of native plant projects are you most interested in? So you heard about a few options here and we're just curious as to what you might be interested in um, in creating in your, in your yard, if anything. Okay, well, we have, oh, 87% participation, no pressure. So it looks like we have a, a wide range uh, with most people interested in a, a larger native garden, but, um, you know, everybody seems to be interested in one aspect of, of, of the projects we talked about today. So thank you. Okay, Emily. 
All right. So that's really great to see how interested um, you guys are in, in kind of introducing some element of native planting into your yards. And just along with that, um, now that we've talked about how to create these things, it's important to also think about maintenance. So um, if you're going to create a large planting, think about the maintenance that might need to go into that. Uh, and everything here that we're going to say is going to be very up to the homeowner. It's going to be up to you as a gardener how much input you want to put in. Uh, it varies quite a bit depending on what your preferences are. Um, but we'll just give you our best tips and tricks and our things we consider important in terms of maintenance. So uh, right off the bat, during and after planting, it's a really good idea to keep track of what you put in the ground. So if you planted plugs into the ground, it can be really helpful to label those plugs or to take pictures of them. Um, some people um, really enjoy kind of like drawing out what they planted and that can be really helpful later because you have a map of exactly what you put where. Um, it also can be helpful. One trick that I like to do is when I put young plants in the ground, I like to take a picture of the foliage. Um, and you can see in the picture below with the example of this is the cup plant species. And you can see how different those young leaves look from the grown plants. And I can't count on my fingers how many times I've been overconfident and said, oh, I'll remember what that is later. And I never do. Um, so kind of looking out for your future self by keeping track of those things is really helpful. For the first few weeks, your planting might need a little bit of babying. So if it hasn't rained, continue to water at least twice a week or more as needed, at least until the plants are established. Um, if the issue you're seeing is, uh, is too much water or a lot of water, and this is especially the case if you've installed a rain garden, you may want to block off that water input source by creating a temporary berm or by using sandbags to block off that input source. Um, and what that does is it just gives the plants a chance to establish themselves and kind of get their roots in the ground before they are met with large inundations of water from a storm event. Um, there is a screen, there we are. Um, also really important, I'm sure you're all very familiar with this in your own yards, but doing as much weeding as possible right when you right when you establish the planting can be really helpful. So the more plant uh, weeding you do early on, the better your native plants are going to be able to establish themselves and later on those weeds won't be able to compete with that nice healthy planting that you've created. So these are just a few examples of very common weeds that you may find in your yard, annual ragweeds, giant ragweeds, horse weed, Lamb's quarters are all very common. Uh, you are probably familiar with your, with your friends or frenemies that show up in your, your own yard. Um, so just be prepared to attack those because um, especially if you've disturbed an area for your planting, you're gonna get a lot of them. In the same realm of weeds, we've talked about quite a bit about invasive plant species. Um, the best advice for these is just to keep an eye out for them so you can remove them as early as possible um, before they establish themselves. They're invasive for a reason. They're very aggressive and they're, they're very competitive even with native plants. So even, especially these species that I've shown here, they grow through the strength of their root system. And so if you find them early, and dig them out with as much of the root system as possible, that can help prevent that really aggressive root system from getting a foothold in the first place. And especially if you're planting a lot of plants that you have never used before, maybe a lot of native plants you're unfamiliar with, you may wanna consider a plant identification app. I myself use the iNaturalist app and it's extremely helpful. I use it all the time and I feel like these apps are getting better at better in identification. So you shouldn't feel intimidated by plant identification because the, there are a lot of tools out there to help you. Next, we'll talk about maintenance, especially of um, the dead vegetation in the fall and winter. So as the homeowner, a lot of this is gonna be up to you and what you want your yard to look like. Um, but the first option that we always put forward is leaving it up, not doing anything with the dead vegetation, that's a really good option. 
Um, other people may prefer to cut everything back and, and rake everything out and remove all that dead vegetation matter and leaf litter. Um, or you can find somewhere in the middle. You can be selective about what plants you keep up, what plants you keep up and allow to stay up over the winter. And as you can see, this example is one that I really love. It's Teresa's rain garden in the winter. And she's left up those plants and they provide a really nice looking uh, texture that kind of breaks up the tedium of just what is a snowy landscape in Wisconsin. Another big plug that we'll put in is, if at all possible, avoid doing fall cleanup. Many native insects overwinter in vegetation and hollow stems are a really important winter hideout, as is leaf litter and brush piles. 30% of bees actually lay their eggs in cavities, hollow stems, or holes in deadwood or snags. And so by leaving this vegetation up over winter, you are providing that habitat for them. Another thing that you can attract by leaving your dead vegetation up is birds really enjoy the seeds from a lot of senest plants. So especially if you leave up things like uh, coneflowers or native sunflowers, you can attract a lot of birds like finches and other species of bird. Uh, if something you're worried about is inviting disease to your native plants, and that's a reason why you don't wanna um, let the vegetation up, keep the vegetation up over winter, um, just know that disease is not really an issue with native plants. They are adapted to Midwestern winters and moisture levels, and they won't be affected if you leave that up. If you decide to install a rain garden, it may require a little bit more maintenance over time, um, just because it has a job to do, and it may be affected by that job. So you're gonna check for ponding, excessive sedimentation, slow draining, or your garden becoming shallow. And these aren't necessarily a bad thing. Um, it just means that your rain garden is doing its job. It's taking that sediment from the stormwater runoff and it's holding it on site. But when you do get to that point where your rain garden is draining slowly, maybe it takes um, more than a day or more than two days to drain, you're gonna wanna think about dredging. And so, some options for dredging are just taking a trowel and digging out the excess of sedimentation in between the plants. Or if you have a lot of sediment that needs to be taken out, what some people do is they, is they completely remove all the plants and then they dig out the layer of sediment that's needed and then they reinstall the plants. And that can be very effective as well. Finally, the fun of maintenance, um, get to know your garden. Um, it can be really rewarding to create these spaces in your yard and you can be involved with them as you want. And um, it can be really rewarding for a lot of people to note changes in seasonality or notice what types of wildlife are visiting their yard. And it doesn't necessarily have to be anything fancy like, like Alda Leopold, you know, falling around a skunk in January and writing everything down. Um, you can interact with your space as you like, and it doesn't matter how small your space is. A lot of exciting things can happen um, if you look closely enough. So make it your own, whether it be through photographs, journals, drawings, little scribbled notes on a calendar. Maybe you invite your family outside once a week to take a walk together through the garden and see what you notice. Just make it your own, whatever that may be. And a modern example um, is using social media to share these things. So this particular photograph was taken by um, a user of Instagram um, whose tag is my nature home. And what he's done is he has logged every little exciting thing that he has seen happen in his yard since he switched it to native vegetation. So we can just see the transition of what is just an average, average size lawn to this kind of native plant mecca with, with amazing things going on. And before I saw the photo of the lawn, it, it, was, it was so surprising to see how much, um, how much wildlife had visited because all of his photos are very close up images of these beautiful creatures that he's seen. And when you zoom out in that, in that space and realize how, how compact that space is, it is wonderful to know like how much life is visiting such a small area in an urban space. And with that, enjoy the fruits of your labor. labor.
Native plantings can be extremely fun and rewarding to create and care for. So whether you're just planning on adding one native plant to sit alongside your existing plants or a larger native planting that involves um, many different species, all inclusions are extremely valuable for the environment and a society's view on what a yard can look like. Thanks, Emily. You heard us talk a little bit about resources and that we're going to be sharing some resources with you uh, as a follow up to this webinar. And I just wanted to highlight a few of the resources uh, that we have available. So uh, most of our resources are on our on our ripple effects website. The website is is listed below. Uh, just some to highlight are we have a downspout garden fact sheet that walks through the whole process of creating a downspout garden. We have a link to the DNR rain garden manual that is goes step by step through how to build a rain garden. I know we kind of glossed over all this really quickly today, uh, but um, you know, don't be worried. Uh, there's a lot of resources to help you. Uh, we even have a lot of resources from our rain garden workshop series that we held last year, last spring. Uh, we even have worksheets to kind of walk you through this manual and walk you through the process of, of building a rain garden. In addition to that, we also have a lot of planting plans. So um, if you're like me, uh, sometimes the, the plants, I they overwhelm me a little bit. I'm not a I'm not a native plant expert myself, and the plants are a little overwhelming. And you know, you don't have to know everything. There are so many planting plans out there, and we have links to a lot of these planting plans for rain gardens and even some for downspout gardens uh, on our website. And there's a whole host of of planting plans out there, um, and we'll send you some links to those. Uh, there's even planting plans for just regular native gardens on uh, websites like the Prairie Nursery website. You can purchase kits and uh, a rain or a plan comes along with it. I did want to highlight, uh, it was mentioned several times, so Plant Dane is a native plant sale that uh, Dane County is involved with and leads. It's going on right now. You can, you can order native plants through a variety of sources. Local nurseries, uh, there's a DNR list of Wisconsin nurseries, you can get them by mail. Uh, you can, you know, a lot of um, friends groups have native plant sales. Uh, this is just one place you can order native plants. So just wanted to highlight, uh, what's available here. We have over 50 species available and we also have kits. So rain garden, downspout garden kits, pollinator kits, edible garden kits. Uh, they're 250 a piece and you have to purchase them in multiples of four. And if you're thinking about ordering through Plant Dane, the order deadline, just wanted to highlight the order deadline is the 22nd. We also have the opportunity for uh, people to donate plants to local projects. So we have a, a grant program where we fund um, or we provide native plants to local schools and community groups that are doing native plant projects and you can donate through the system as well. And you also have the option to even grow your own native plants. So we have a native plant workshop, growers workshop uh, in the fall uh, winter time. And we have instructions, those are actually on our website as well, on how you can grow native plants from seed uh, using milk jugs and um, over, over the winter and then have them available to plant in your garden uh, come the summertime. That concludes our webinar today. Uh, I really appreciate everybody coming and I appreciate, uh, I think I wanted to thank all the presenters that um, that have spoke today and presented today. Um, they provide a wealth of knowledge as you can kind of tell from the Q&A, uh, they've been answering questions the whole time. So I just wanted to take an opportunity to, um, to thank them. And I don't think there's any other questions. Um, presenters, if you wanna, you can put your video back on if you want. Uh, I'm just checking through the Q&A if there were any additional questions that we did not answer here or that just popped up. We got them all. I think so too. Great job, everybody. <laughs> so um, we are at about time, actually six minutes over. I apologize. And uh, I did want to let you know, just we will be sending a follow up email uh, with that follow up email. There'll be a link to some of these resources we're talking about. Um, 
Those are in addition to the ones that are on our website uh, that we talked about today. And then there's also going to be a link to a short survey on that um, in that email. If you would complete that survey, we'd, we'd really appreciate it. We just want to hear um, about your ideas and, and whether you uh, found this, this webinar beneficial. Um, so please, if you have time to take that survey, uh, again, we'd really appreciate it. That'll be in the, in the follow-up email. I did just want to mention um, that we are also going to be doing a kind of a community rain garden build uh, in the beginning of June, probably in the first couple of weeks of June, uh, where we're we're partnering with uh, a resident and we're um, we're building a rain garden for them, and we're we're doing this uh, as a as an event, an educational event, so that those that are interested in, in rain gardens and want that hands-on experience um, have an opportunity to do so. So if you're interested, uh, let me know and I can kind of keep you on my list and I'll uh, send out email, um, in, in, I'll email information um, as we kind of finalize dates, but it'll be, it'll be first couple weeks in, in June. And, you know, doesn't mean you have to come and spend the whole day with us and, and you know, and dig out a rain garden. You can just come and observe too, but it's an educational opportunity for, for those that are interested. I think that's all I have. Uh, presenters, do you have any other parting words? Okay. Thanks, thank everybody. you, everybody. Oops, go ahead, Maddie. <laughs> I was just gonna say thank you. Awesome. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Have a good night. <laughs>